So our next lesson is going to be on expressive self-portraits. And we're going to need to pull on some information we did previously when we took notes from this book, The Emotional Color Wheel. You'll find those notes in your workbook and I'll have a link uh, up there for you to connect with or down in the description. So uh, what we're looking for is not just a portrait that you know, is supposed to look like you, um, but we're going to be adding a layer of symbolism to that so it tells us a little bit more about who you are as a person. But we're also going to tie this into biology and the human proportions of a face so that the faces look more realistic. So we need to balance this idea of realism along with expressionism as we try to express something through our portraits. Being an artist means more than just being a machine and replicating what you see. A camera does that just fine. So why should an artist just copy what it is they see? Kind of is a waste of time when you have a camera available. So we're going to go beyond that and we're going to be making expressive self-portraits. So in your um, workbook, and certainly uh, your teacher can provide additional resources if you don't have this, um, we have a page, it's uh, 66 and 67, and I'll project some of that up here, where we get to see the proportions of a human face. And there's a lot of geometry that's sort of happening in there. When you look at the face, you'll notice that the forehead is just gigantic. But when you actually measure a human face and you measure the space from the eyes to the chin, you'll notice that it's the same distance from the eyes to the top of the head. The reason for that is we have this thing called a brain. So a lot of times when you see pictures people draw, the eyes are like way too high up. That means they haven't left enough room for a brain and that person couldn't really live if that was a real person. So why don't we notice this, you know, this huge forehead? Well, because when we communicate with other people, we're only looking at this portion of their face. We look at the eyes, we look at the mouth, and we try to see the expression to try and understand, are they being ironic? Are they being truthful? Are they um, flirting? Whatever it is that's kind of going on through the face, we notice here. But when we draw it, we kind of forget about all this other stuff that we don't notice. If I cover up my face from here, you'll notice, oh my God, his forehead is just gigantic. It's because I'm smart, but also it's because we just don't really notice it from day to day. So this face map is going to help you. So there are some certain things that we know are generally true about the human face. And things will vary from this depending on the person. So we know that the eyes are always going to be about halfway down. Now the shape of the head, we just put an oval here, but some faces are a little bit more square. Some faces are a little bit more egg shaped, some with the egg facing down, some with the egg facing up. Uh, and some, uh, if you're more muscular, it'll be more angular. Um, and some people have more rounded faces like I do. So the shape is going to be kind of what it is you see in a mirror. Or you could take a photograph of yourself and work from that. I'm okay with that as well. So you draw a line going right across the middle of the face. And that's going to re represent the eye level. Then from what's remaining, you're going to put another line down the middle of what's left. So we have the eyes. And halfway down there is the bottom edge of the nose. So we know that's where the nose is going to go. You'll also notice that the eyes and the nose match up with the top and bottom of the ear. That's another thing in human proportions. Now it looks a little different if the face is pointing down or the face is pointing up. But in general, in a forward facing portrait, the eye level is going to match with the top of the ear and the nose level is going to match with the bottom of the ear. The next thing is once you've got this cut in half, we're going to cut in half again and that's going to be the bottom edge of the bottom lip. So if you think of the, the line that's going across here as like a water line and then you have the boat kind of on top of that, that's the bottom lip. Some people make the mistake of putting the line through the lips and that's just not correct. So as you can see here in my diagram and in your workbook, the line should be the bottom edge of the bottom lip. You'll also notice a few other things. We have some diagonals in the face and some lines that are going up and down to kind of help you line up things. In general, the eyes will be about five eyes going across the face. So if you measure one, you can divide it into fifths and you'll be able to get the right proportions. There generally is about the width of an eye between the eyes. If it's too close, it makes someone look like they might have Down syndrome, which is a genetic disorder which forces the eyes to be a little bit closer than they should be. 
but actually the eyes separate a little bit is sometimes a genetic disorder that most people kind of like. You'll notice that supermodels tend to have their eyes a little bit wider apart. And there's something about that that culturally we seem to think that that's a good thing. So something to pay attention to. <clears throat> You'll also notice that the center of the eyes will generally match with the corners of the mouth. So that's another thing you can line up. Now, if you get a ruler and hold it up to a mirror, maybe your mouth is smaller than that or larger than that. So then you would draw it smaller or larger depending on what you see. You can also draw a triangle from the corners of the mouth to the center of the eye, and it should line up with the edge of your nose. Now, some people have a nose that's a little bit more broad, so it will go outside of that line, and some people have a more narrow nose, which will go inside of that line. Then we need to look at the pieces and parts. When you look carefully at an, an eye, you'll notice it's not an almond shape. It's not a football shape. You have a tear duct, you have angles that kind of make up the eyes. So you'll want it to pay careful attention to the angles and the curves that make up the eye. And one eye might actually be slightly higher or lower than the other one. It's very rare that the eyes sort of line up. The nose too is maybe it's symmetrical, but it might be that one side is a little bit more curved and one side might be a little bit more angular. These are the kind of things you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to as you're drawing your portrait. So uh, once you get all of those things down, we call this a face map. You first kind of draw this with the shape of your head. Then you start laying on the things that you have in your drawing lightly with pencil. And then when you feel more sure of the things, then you can draw them in a little bit more darkly. Then you need to think of the expressive aspect of the portrait you're doing. What is it you want to show? What do you want to tell about yourself? And you can hide it symbolically or you can just be out there. It's really up to you. But we want to see something that you're doing symbolically with the portrait to tell us a little bit of a story about you. I'm going to show you nine examples of what some of my students have done in the past. This one, you could see that the student has done a blue background with some um, nature sorts of elements behind him. He felt really tied to nature, but he was also going through this struggle where his parents and his family weren't necessarily caring about the environment, and he would go around and pick up their garbage and recycle it and separate it. So it really sort of bothered him, and it was something he was doing secretly. He never told his family that he was doing that, but the environment and the world and you know the oceans were really important to him. That also is why he has the tear in his eye to kind of show that the pain of that and kind of noticing that. This next one we could see is full of sports in the face that he's got the New York Yankees cap on, but then he has all these beach kind of things going on. He was really a lover of baseball and he was hoping to get a baseball scholarship to go off to college. And he wanted to go to a college near a beach because that was one of his goals. He just loved the beach and being with his family there. And he was a little worried about all of that, which is why the face looks a little worried. Those eyebrows kind of tip down a little bit to show that sense of worry and struggle. This next one we have the student is you know, really gone wild with this. And the head is sort of open. We all have all these things kind of leaking out. And the idea is that she's kind of concerned about her thoughts and all these things that are kind of going on in her life. And the face is sort of purple because she's very shy. We know that color, the color purple is a color that represents somebody who's kind of somber. And then she used orange for her shirt to kind of represent you know, this duality that's a very calm color along with a very aggressive color. So there's a lot of struggle kind of going on in this image. And the next one, the student has sort of separated himself into two parts. And you can see that he was really, really loving the whole anime stuff and really wanted to go to Japan someday. So he put that on the one side and the other side was kind of the struggles, the things that would keep him from being able to go to Japan. So those are done in blue with the thundercloud behind. So we have this juxtaposition, these opposites going together in the face. This next one is done by a more advanced student. She'd been doing art like all of her life and was obviously very good at it. So she did this as a watercolor painting. But you can see that it looks like one layer is ripped away uh, for another one. So she's trying to show her connection to Mother Earth and being connected that way, but also kind of the struggle of her being independent from her family and kind of how that's, that's happening. So she's got her hand up saying, whoa, I need to live my own life, but I still need to follow my family rules and things, but her yearning to be free. So we get a little bit of that struggle back and forth. And this next one, she felt like she was kind of falling apart in pieces. So we've got the portrait done on several cards 
that she kind of laid out and then there's this peaceful sort of background like she's starting to come together so she faced a struggle but she's starting to come together and use that symbolically in her work this next one the young man has these roads all over his face because he loves road trips he loves going places uh, and that's part of his dream and then we have some of the ocean uh, below I don't remember specifically what all the symbolism was, but I do remember that he loved doing road trips and going and traveling. And I think that's kind of the connection he's trying to make here. This next one, we have a kind of a fractured background and we could see different patterns in the background to kind of show off parts of the personality. She sees the outside world as this adventure that she really can't wait to get into. But right now you can see her face is practically black and white. So she feels kind of contained a little bit um, like she's not able to express herself right now as a young lady, but then hoping to be able to break out of that. So we see that shattered sort of image there. And then this last one, you can see that she's really loving the earth and the energy and nature and sees herself as kind of this nature queen. And it's a very powerful sort of image. And I love the way the hair kind of elongates out into these radiating background lines. Each one of these is very different. They're all the same project. They're all an expressive portrait. But the artist has been able to change things around to kind of show off what it is that is important to them, what it is that's going through their mind. Sometimes we know exactly what's going on in the image, and sometimes it's very symbolic, and that's okay. So make sure you first do a sketch before you move on to final paper. Follow the directions in the workbook for the position of the face, because that's going to be about half of the grade. Are the things where they belong and are they the size they belong? That's half of the grade. The other half of the grade is going to be on the expressive quality of what you do. And we'll use our rubric to grade that and then a critique form later on to kind of look at our work and discuss it. So give this one a try, sketch, draw and create.